thank you very much. I should also uh, first off uh, mention um, uh, my co-author, Andrew. Andrew and I worked on what well, you're about to see, but um, Andrew is based overseas in Edinburgh, and, and so he's not here today. But I just really wanted to strongly mention a lot of this work has been undertaken by Andrew. I'm just presenting on his behalf. So. Um, uh, yeah, so I'm presenting this tool that was uh, an output of a, a New Zealand funded research pro project um, call, and the tool's called the Antarctic Data Analysis. So this is probably what most people think of Antarctica. They think of these lovely large vistas, that's Mount Erebus up in the, the top here and this is what's called the uh, ice ridges on Scott Base and you can wander around them when you're down there. Um, or you think of these lovely vistas of the dry valleys whereby uh, it's ice-free and, and it's just really majestic when you get down to there. Or if you're my seven and five-year-old child, they think of penguins. <laughs> um, absolutely, that is exactly what Antarctica is when you're down there. But Antarctica is, as some people might know, a natural reserve uh, dedicated to science and peace. Um, and um, there is one very important place where that is undertaken and managed, and that's not in Antarctica. It's around the table every year at the Antarctic Treaty Meetings. And this is a group of all of the countries who are part of that Antarctic Treaty that get together once a year to talk about issues about how we manage and maintain Antarctica as that natural reserve for peace and science. This is the first one, 1961 in Canberra. Um, this is a more recent one, Brazil 2014, uh, rotates around all of the countries in alphabetical order. So we went around once, we're back into Brazil, I think we've been around twice, now back into Brazil. Um, uh, it, it's, um, yeah, and so obviously over that period of time, the way in which these countries interact and operate um, to manage Antarctica has changed significantly. You can straight away see lots of computers. Everyone's on a computer here nowadays. Uh, everything was all paper back in the day. Um, but what we are seeing through that rise from back in the early time part of the Antarctic Treaty System through to now is that some, from science perspective, we're understanding lots more knowledge around the system and how that how how you know the system is responding to change. But what's happening is the policy makers, the people that sit in that meeting room once a year and make all the rules and make all the decisions about how we're going to manage this environment is lagging behind. And it's this gap between the two is every year getting larger and larger and larger and larger. And we're seeing major issues whereby the science community is getting very frustrated because we have not saying all the answers, but we have some strong indications of what's occurring down here and what needs to happen, but the policymakers aren't able to move it, change. And there's a couple of reasons for that. One is uh, scientists are information rich, we know what's happening, but the policymakers and the people that you saw around those tables are not scientists. They're people, part, usually parts of in New Zealand, there's this Ministry for Foreign Affairs and Trade, so they're diplomats. They, they're usually diplomats that sit around the table. Sometimes they've never been to Antarctica, they've never seen Antarctica. They've been on the desk for maybe a year, they have to read a couple of reports, go along and then talk about, you know, knowledgeably in this, at these meetings about Antarctica and about these issues. So there's this gap. The second one is they work on consensus. So every country has to agree. If one country says, nah, don't agree with that rule, it doesn't happen. And the problem there is you need good information base across all of the parties, not just the ones that can invest lots of money in, the, in, in science and get lots of information and be knowledgeable about these meetings, but all of them. So all of the countries have to have sort of a baseline of knowledge about how it's, how, what's happening down there. And so what we see at the moment is uh, that papers, so journal articles, are the main way in which knowledge gets introduced into these into this forum. And you get to see this transfer between the science and the policymakers back and forth. And that is too slow as well. So even that generation of knowledge through papers takes a long time to get out into the, to, to the um, environment. And so what we've been looking at and working with the Antarctic Treaty System and the Secret, Antarctic Treaty Secretariat is a couple of tools, and I'm talking about one of them called ADA. And that's primarily to make sure that um, 
the people that go to these meetings not only have the knowledge base about what's happening in Antarctica, but actually can query and interact and understand how Antarctica is changing and what are some of the effects that we're seeing on the ground, both spatially and temporally, um, you know, explained in a, a more sp a spatial and temporal way. I'll stop just before I jump into the showing you the tool. I will also discuss this aspect if anyone is interested in Antarctica. There is this wonderful open package called Quantarctica. I'm a theme leader within the, within the most recent version of it. Um, it is a fantastic repository of open scientific data around Antarctica, and I highly recommend it. But again, even Quantarctica um, is, is geared, you know, while it's for all, it is definitely geared towards people that can pick up QJS, install it on their soft, on their computers, and run with it to analyze that data. And it takes a lot of knowledge to do that. The, the, the average policymaker around the, that meeting room doesn't have that ability. To be perfectly honest, a lot of the, 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 governments are, the, the, the government departments that they work in lock down their PCs that they can't even install that type of software on there. Uh, and so it's hard. That's the type of information they should be seeing, but they can't access it. Um, Quantarctica comes from QGIS plus Antarctica, Quantarctica. And then there's the web address there if you're interested, but Google will find it as well. So highly recommend if you're interested in looking at it in a little bit more detail. So we developed um, something that would work in most web browsers, um, a tool uh, to, to, um, to enable um, users uh, to explore, interact, and understand how Antarctica is changing. Um, so it's called Ada, usual sort of um, template, a um, couple of tools up here to, to run animations using the temporal data, some a variety of query tools, and, uh, and a map with some zooming and all that type of functionality. Um, I should mention it's still in what we're classing as a, as a beta. Um, it's still being discussed at the Antarctic Treaty meetings around its use. Um, for it to become a formal product, again, all the countries have to agree upon it, and then it will then be adopted within their processes. So hopefully at the next meeting that will occur. So when you do go along, and I'll, I'll put up the web address at the end of the, the presentation, which it's, it's open to all, um, you'll see that when you log in, it'll say it's a beta, and we're still developing and adding more data. But um, we have gone through and built, you know, like just even simple things, like a really good base map of Antarctica is just not around. Um, they have very at coarse resolution um, uh, base data, they have good satellite imagery and so forth, but just even uh, understanding, it's amazing when you're talking to environmental managers, they're saying, I've got this, this um, science event that wants to go to this location, I want it to understand where it is even, you know what I mean? And so it's just even them to be able to look up a gazetteer and find the name and so forth, and so obviously we've got the gazetteer all in here and you can search the location and it'll show those locations and all that type of stuff to enable um, environmental managers to, to, to understand um, more detail around some of the, the decisions that they have to make. So I'll just show you some of the data that's within it. This is one of the outputs of the science side, that, um, part of the, the, uh, the program we've been collating over the, for the last 15 years, a high resolution database of how, where in Antarctica people go um, to try and understand the, the, the rising influence, uh, the rising impacts of us in the system down there. Um, and um, so this is just a map showing within, and we've just binned it to show it at this resolution. But we've wanted to bring that in there because the number one thing that we're seeing at the moment is how many people have been here before. And that's not necessarily for the aspects around uh, impact. From the scientists want to know that as well because we're doing more and more DNA analysis and so forth. They wanted to go to pristine sites so they're not collecting DNA samples that are being in, in influenced by other people going there and potentially um, you know, camping in these locations. And so we're looking at that type of stuff. So this is, um, so sorry, that was it there, but then we've pulled it in here and you can explore and so you can hover over. And this is, this is one season, the 2014-15 season, but you could scroll this back and forth to look at it over time and explore basically how um, activity has changed in each of those seasons. And you can see the, the really high activity locations of the two bases in the, the Rossi region. Uh, Scott base, which is the New Zealand base, and uh, McMurdo Station, which is the US base, which is right there. 
But again, just for environmental managers or the policy makers, it's even just providing like even like I want, you know, I've got an event that's trying to go to this one location here. Um, what is uh, around here? Um, what av what's the elevation? Um, where's the closest managed areas or protected areas? There, there are managed and protected areas within the system. Um, you know, uh, is it ice free? But you know, we, we've been layering more and more information on here around aspects like um, understanding um, what's happening with uh, temperature. So this is land surface temperature coming from the motor satellite. You can click on one location, uh, two locations. So this is down at um, the most northern point within the Rossi region, and this is within the McMurdo Dry Valleys, and you can explore basically the ribbons of the last uh, eight years of, of land surface temperature averaged out on a monthly basis, and you can look at the ribbons. And so again, I didn't mention it, but um, I, I meant to mention this earlier. So there's an, it, this obviously has been built using a wide variety of open source tools. PostGIS, Node.js, MapServer, MapCache, but we're doing all these live uh, with D3JS um, to provide um, that move away from just data to knowledge, to understanding what is occurring. And so this is showing that, um, as you'd expect, but considering it's about a yeah, number of hundreds of kilometers between here, we're seeing differences in, in the climate uh, at those two locations. But again, um, we're also looking at it, we've modeled back into the past, uh, back to 1980, for a number of uh, climate attributes. We've also modeled out to 2100 with a number of climate attributes. And you can also explore uh, you know, comparisons like this as well. So there's a number of things. One, I've shown you the point. Um, so there's three different types of queries. There's a single point query, where you can choose one location. There's the dual query. Sorry, I'm going the wrong way. The dual query of, of you know, uh, two locations, and you can look at um, comparisons. And then we have a third one looking at transects. Um, so this is more predominantly for scientists to wanting to explore various aspects, but you can look at the digital elevation model across the transect, but also the changes in some of the climate attributes over that range as well. And you can hop, pull this across and move that line, and you can explore a variety of aspects. But again, it, um, this, these are when working with the Antarctic Treaty Secretariat, these are the types of things that they want to utilize when they're doing permitting, but also when they're responding to questions around um, what is how Antarctica is changing some of the pressures that we're on, we're, we're seeing down there. So this is another one. So this is looking at human activity. So we had the hex bins earlier, but um, again, this is a point query of a location, and we're exploring basically. Um, over um, you know, certain concentric rings around that location, how many people have been within these areas? Because again, there's more and more questions around how uh, much human activity there has been in certain locations. We can export those as both the time series and you can have it as a summary table as well for input into the, um, the treaty process. As with most, um, most sources like this, especially if we're putting it up in front of the Antarctic Treaty, the first question is, where do you get this data? And so we have a very robust uh, data provenance section that details explicitly where we go. And we try, wherever we can, to use authoritative and, and uh, data sets that have been um, signed off by the treaty, because that lowers the bar, and they can just accept that. Sorry, I've got timing on, so it keeps moving it along. Um, so there's a full uh, data um, provenance sort of section. But um, as I said earlier, the Antarctic Treaty um, works with these, I don't want to say dumb, they're not dumb, not at all, but they're naive about how to utilize this type of, um, these types of tools. And so what we've done uh, is we've built a number of queries within here. So there's a number of standard tasks that most countries need to undertake. And so we've built a number of, uh, queries that literally walk you through on how you can do this and in a format that will produce it for um, pulling into the Antarctic Treaty process. Uh, so yeah, we're working more and more on a number of additional queries as we go through to, to reinforce how that they can use this tool over time. So that's the end. That's, it. that's the web address, Ada. If you'd like to um, contact us, by all means, please do. And uh, again, just reinforcing uh, my thanks to our funding agency, MB. Thank you very much. Questions, anyone? Just give me the look and then I'll go to you. 
sorry, not really a scientific related question, but um, you mentioned that there's no good base map available, and have you you guys have built one? Um, are you making that base map available for use? I mean, for producing other stuff from it? Yes. Um, and we are looking at moving it into Quantarctica at some point in time in the next version release. Um, uh, and so y the answer is yes, we will be making it available. Not right at the moment, but once the Antarctic Treaty adopts this, um, we have said that we would make a lot of, well, most of the data, unless it's been given to us uh, under a, you know, that we're not allowed to share it, uh, available. Uh, and the base map would be one of those aspects. Uh, so there was someone here. I'd never heard of Quantarctica, so it's really cool. I'm going to check it out. Um, but do you know instances where data journalists have used it to tell stories to the public? Because it would be a great resource for them. Couldn't agree more, um, but no. Um, there is a number of journalists. So the, the New Zealand Science Program has a community and journalism um, uh, outreach program that allows journalists to go down, but they they don't do data journalism, unfortunately. They will more focus on uh, looking at penguins and things like that. Sorry, nothing wrong with penguins. I love them too. Just a quick question. Um, the other agency does a lot of work in that space is Kemla. Mm. Are you actually working with Kemla or is there some independence between the two? No, so we're working a lot with SCAR. Uh, which uh, feeds into um, CAMLA as well. Uh, and obviously the Antarctic Treaty is the overarching body for both CAMLA and the Committee for Environmental Protection. Uh, CAMLA, um, you know, we're not constrained. We're looking at the terrestrial space because the MB program that it was funded by it was a terrestrial focused one. But the tool is completely um, um, able to, to do the marine side of things. I've been in discussions with your colleague Matt, Matt Pinkerton, uh, who I do a lot of work with around pulling some of the stuff from his um, activities down there into here because he also agrees that CAMLA would be a low-hanging fruit for something like this to be more available for some of the CAMLA parties. Sorry, CAMLA talks in, in relation to the marine side of the, uh, of the system uh, below 60 degrees south. Sorry. Um, the McMurdo um, and Terranova, the Italian base, mm. is, is in the same dependency. Yes. Do you, do you cooperate and work with USGS and other, and get information and data from their sources? Um, yes and no. I, 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 so um, we have worked with them. They've been involved. The, the US, um, uh, uh, what do you call it? The, the um, environment arm of NSF that goes along to the Antarctic Treaty meetings has been involved. They've pointed us to a number of people. We've been able to get any of their open data. Um, there's a, a great outfit called the Polar Geospatial Centre that coordinates a lot of that stuff on behalf of the NSF. Uh, and so, yes, we've been able to get access to some of those things. Um, there's always an, an aspect from my perspective of until it's adopted by the treaty system, then we'll see more traction because it will be, it, it, there's this chicken and egg system. We're trying to get something to that point, um, but we don't want to look like we're just New Zealand pushing this barrow um, that we have. To, but yeah, so hopefully once we get to that stage, then we'll get more and more adoption and we will be making this open for all to add more and more data. We do want to run a curated process because it's not meant to be a data repository. It's to explain how Antarctica is changing. So there has to be some narrative around that and, and have a, a direct um, a link with a, a, a policy question. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, hi. Uh, thanks for your great work. I just found out about this. Uh, I, I'm actually from the Antarctic Research Center at VIC. I was wondering if, uh, does this tie into any stuff um, with like the Antarctic Science Platform we have in New Zealand yes. at all? Yes, indeed. I am part of the Antarctic Science Platform. I'm an objective lead within one of the four projects. And within that, my objective is to utilise this as well as a variety of other aspects to, foreca to, to basically um, start to show how we forecast uh, the biology of Antarctica to be affected by a warming world. So we will be utilising this as a platform. We hope to be utilising this as a platform over the six-year life of the program. Fraser, I want to ask a question. Yeah, sure. I love I love Antarctica. Thank you very much. It's very nice because you can just click everything and what. Uh, as as a person who makes maps, I want people to understand the world, and I also shared the assumption that with more information, we hope people make the right choices. Mm. 
So from another field, we made a, a map where human rights violations were happening to make people think that, you know, this happens in low-income neighborhoods. And then we did data journalism, and then the interpretation was, yeah, that's, that's where it happens. And that was unexpected from us. So in your, in your case, were there any moments that uh, you made this data set, and then the interpretation was, oh, this is interesting, or I was surprised? Again, it goes back to that sort of thing, and, and it's not it's not being utilised within the Antarctic Treaty system yet. It's been a lot of the Antarctic Treaty people have been using it, and yes, they've been really interested in things around human activity, but also understanding the way in which different parts of Antarctica are expected to ch to change in a warming world. Um, so yes, there is there, we're seeing it sort of on a one on one basis. Um, the, the problem with the Antarctic tree system is it's sort of one of the issues that I said beforehand, again, is consensus. We can still put all this information in front of people. One country just says, no, nah, I don't agree with that. No. And so, but again, then there's still a basis here that we can point at and say, this is the best scientific evidence. You're still going to ignore that? That's a problem. Um, so, yeah. Sorry, one yeah. yeah. Uh, I will be in Antarctica next month. I will be there for one week. So uh, it's my first time. I'm really excited about the trip. And also, I don't want just to be there as like a tourist, I want to do something else. Okay. So in advance, what do you recommend that I can like prepare for being there and be able to help either remotely or inside? I will be there like one week. Okay, so um, it, uh, if you really want to, you could take down a GPS, one of my little GPS trackers, because one of the key things I'm looking at is the way people uh, interact with the ice-free parts of Antarctica and wayfind around there, and also to understand how they move, to, move within the ice-free area. So if you really wanted to join into the science program, I've got um, some little trackers that we could tack on and, and so forth, um, because I'm really interested in that longer term. Yeah. So let's talk. Last thing, Fraser, thank you very no, much. Thank you. Thank you. Get